All right, we are good. Welcome everyone to the OUSSG's second live stream of Hillary Term. We have a slight change of format for this evening. At the end of the talk and the Q&A, we'll be having a 15 to 20 minute session where our members are welcome to stay and have an informal chat about their thoughts of the event and generally to foster a sense of OUSSG community. Um, before we start, I'd also like to remind those in attendance that if you'd like to get involved in the committee, please get in touch with a member of the committee or with me at my OUSSG secretary email address. Our guest tonight is Professor Timothy Garton-Ash, Professor of European Studies at the University of Oxford. An award-winning historian, Professor Garton-Ash is also an international affairs columnist at The Guardian and author of 10 books of political writing or history of the present, charting Europe's transformation over the past 50 years. He has recently published his latest edition of his book, The Magic Lantern, The Revolutions of 89 Witnessed in Warsaw, Budapest, Berlin and Prague. Tonight, Professor Garth Nash will be speaking on the subject of can a dictatorship be a member of the EU? Without further ado, Professor Garth Nash, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much, Miriam, and it's lovely to be with this group again. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about two European countries, uh, Hungary and Poland, and their relationship to the EU. But even if you're not a Europeanist or European, uh, I hope this will be of interest to um, people who are thinking about what kind of a creature the EU is, a very strange creature in the multiverse of international relations and strategic studies. The British government, as you know, the current British government is trying to pretend it's only an international organization, which is why they've made the childish and stupid and short-sighted decision not to recognize the EU's ambassador as a full ambassador. But as we all know, actually, the EU is much more than just an international organization. What we don't quite know is what exactly it is. And I think asking the question, can a dictatorship be a member of the EU, is, is one interesting way into that question. A quick word about how I come to this subject. As Miriam mentioned in the introduction, um, I started out already as a graduate student from Oxford in the late 1970s, writing about the countries of East Central Europe. In fact, as a graduate student at Oxford, I attended one of the early sessions of OUSSG under your founding father, Michael Howard. Um, and I was particularly interested in the dissidents and the opposition movements in East Central Europe, followed them right the way through the 1980s, through the liberation of 1989, which is a subject of that book, The Magic Lantern, the transitions to democracy through the 1990s, joining NATO, joining the EU in 2004, and then 2007. And somewhere about 10 years ago, I said to myself, mission accomplished. These are now secure liberal democracies safely in the EU. Surely nothing can go wrong. Um, warning, never say mission accomplished. It normally goes wrong soon thereafter. And it did indeed this case because it was precisely at this moment, 2010, on his re-election that Viktor Orban started dismantling democracy in Hungary. So much so that famously at an EU summit in 2015, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, the e European Commission president who famously laughed, liked a glass of wine or five at lunch, greeted Viktor Orban uh, uh, after lunch at this summit with the jovial words, hello, dictator. Hello, dictator, um, which he thought was a great joke, but some of us don't think is such a great joke. In Hungary, the process of erosion of democracy inside a member state of the European Union started in 2010 with the re-election of Viktor Orban. 
In Poland, it's in 2015 with the election of the law and justice government and then a law and justice president. Now, if you had the Hungarian government spokesman on this call, he would immediately say, what do you mean not a democracy? Of course, Hungary is a democracy. So let me first of all defend that claim. You've all heard the term illiberal democracy. Illiberal democracy, strictly speaking, is a contradiction in terms. A democracy is either liberal or it's not a democracy. It's certainly not a liberal democracy. But it's quite a useful term, I think, to describe the process of the degradation, the erosion of an existing liberal democracy. So that, for example, even in the United States at a certain point in the not too distant past, um, namely before the 20th of January, some people might have feared that it was becoming an illiberal democracy. And I think this is a useful term to describe where Poland is at the moment. Hungary is way beyond that. Hungary, I would say, in the categories of political science, is either a hybrid authoritarian or a competitive authoritarian regime. Some of you may have heard the term demokratura, a mixture of the characteristics of democracy and dictatorship. And the question is, how did we get there? And why hasn't the EU done more about it? So first of all, how did we get there? What you have to understand is that the process of state building in the post-communist democracies of East Central Europe was simultaneously the process of member state building for the EU. Hungary applied to join the EU already in 1994. Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, those, all the transition democracy was made in the spirit of and in the sense of preparing to be a member state of the European F uh, Union and fulfilling the criteria for being a member state of the European Union. And in preparation for this enlargement, the EU suddenly realized it needed to have a set of criteria for membership. And so it developed at the Copenhagen summit in uh, 1993, the so-called Copenhagen criteria, which say membership requires that candidate country has achieved stability of institutions guaranteeing democracy, the rule of law, human rights, respect for and protection of minorities, the existence of a functioning market economy, etc. So the criteria are already there. Now, what this means is that someone like Viktor Orban knew exactly what you had to do to qualify as a member state, or perhaps more accurately, what you had to be seen to be doing, what you had to be seen to be doing. Um, so that when he came to dismantle democracy in Hungary after 2010, you already had a, a perfect, if you will, facade or presentation uh, in complete conformity with the requirements of EU membership. And he understood very well that his job was to dismantle democracy while preserving the facade and meeting so far as possible all the formal criteria of EU membership. Um, two years ago, Freedom House quite rightly reclassified Hungary not as a free country, but as a partly free country. Um, now, part of this very skillful dismantlement while maintaining the facade was in every area to keep the externals of liberal democracy and pluralism as visible as possible. And here's the point. If you point to any single feature of the system of Viktor Orban's Hungary, the Hungarian government spokesman can probably point to another European country which has something like that. The electoral system, 
It's like that over there. Political appointment of judges, it's like that over there. Um, politicized public administration, it's like that over there. This feature of the media, it's like that over there. What makes this system hybrid authoritarian is the aggregation of all these different features. Um, at a certain point, as the Marxists used to say, quantity becomes quality. So, for example, just to give a few features, you have a highly politicized public administration such that in, uh, in elections, state monies can be used for the campaign for the ruling party, Fides. The electoral law has been changed many times so that it gives a very unrepresentative uh, 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 result. No doubt the Hungarian government spoke from the point to Britain at this point. Um, for example, millions of Hungarians living in neighboring countries have Hungarian citizenship and the vote in Hungarian elections. They can vote by postal ballot but Hungarians living in the West or the rest of the world have actually to go to the consulate. So there's a clear inequality between the two. Um, the media landscape looks wonderfully plural um, at first glance, but the reality behind the facade is that almost all the main influential media are owned by business people who are either henchmen of Victor Orban and Fides, or depend on the government for contracts in other parts of their business, plus the fact that only Fides friendly media get state advertising, which is a large part of their budget. And I could go on down the list of individual points showing you how, in each individual case, the reality behind the facade, the pay réel rather than the pay légal is one of a hybrid authoritarian system. What is more, the EU has facilitated this erosion of democracy in two significant ways. First of all, very large flows of EU funds have gone to Hungary, most of them dispersed through the central government, i.e. through Fidesz, uh, to give a sense of the figures over the 2014 to 2020 period, it was roughly 3, 3 to 3.5% of Hungary's GDP. For Poland, it was 12%. Both in absolute and in relative terms, these sums are larger than the sums that went to Western Europe under the Marshall Plan. So what the EU has been giving these countries over the last seven years is larger than the Marshall Plan, mainly dispersed by the national government, and according to the EU's own investigations, extremely corruptly used. More than 90% of public investment in Hungary has some element of EU money. Um, and, and we know that this is used to re reward friendly oligarchs, friendly business people, friendly media, um, to cultivate particular consti constituencies, not to mention family and friends. The other unintended consequence of the EU membership is, as all of you know, at the heart of the EU is, is freedom of movement. Indeed, to make a brief commercial for my research project at St. Anthony's uh, on Europe, we've just published some polling results on europeanmoments.com, europeanmoments.com, which shows that in the EU member states and UK, 74% of those asked say the EU would not be worth having if it did not have freedom of movement. Think about that. Almost three quarters wouldn't be worth having. So this is one of the most precious things of the EU. But the unintended consequence is that people who are fed up with an illiberal and authoritarian regime in Hungary can come and study at Oxford. There are probably some on this call or work in Berlin or Paris or wherever it may be. And very significant levels of emigration have been seen, particularly among the more liberal, energetic, dynamic, better educated parts of the uh, population. Maybe we couldn't have avoided that. Maybe that's just what the EU is, but it is an unintended consequence, whereas the money is not. So now I turn it round and I ask from the EU point of view, can 
a dictatorship be a member of the EU. Um, there are two ways to understand that question in English, answer. One is, may a, a dictatorship be a member of the EU? Is it allowed to? The other is, can it in practice get away with it? And roughly speaking, I want to answer that the answer to the first question is clearly no, and the answer to the se second question is so far broadly yes. Um, first of all, in principle, Article 2 of the Consolidated Treaty of the European Union, which I'm sure you all have by your bedsides, says the Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. So important is this, that in Article 3, it says the Union's aim is to promote peace, its values, and the well-being of its people. In Article 6, it says the EU recognizes the rights, freedom, and the principles set out in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which shall have the same legal value as the treaties. And in Article 7, it says that if there is a unanimous vote um, by all but one member state in the European Council, that a particular member state is in serious and persistent breach of the values referred to in Article 2, democracy, rule of law, human rights, it can be effectively be suspended as a member, not expelled. There is no provision for expulsion. The only thing countries can do is to expel themselves, as Britain has just done, but suspended. And then Article 10, just to rub it in, says the functioning of the uni union shall be founded on representative democracy. So if you take its constitution, um, the European Union would appear to place absolute cardinal value on democracy and human rights, both in its member states and in the union itself. But hey presto, Hungary, which as I've just argued is clearly not a liberal democracy and probably not a democracy at all, is still a full member of the EU. Why? How has this been possible? A few reasons, a couple of last remarks, and then I'll open it up for discussion. Um, the first and really important point is that if you look back at the whole history of European integration after 1945, the Europe of values and the Europe of money were in two separate institutions or sets of institutions. So the Europe of values, the original attempt at European Union was the Council of Europe, which of course comes before the European Community, the European Convention on Human Rights, the Strasbourg Court, European Court of Human Rights. That's where the values of rule of law, the human rights, the democracy are. The European Union was the European Economic Community and is still at its heart a, an economic community. And what we have done is, so to speak, to retrofit the values into the European Economic Committee, uh, Community as you retrofit an old house like the one I'm talking to you from with um, better environmental protection, better insulation and so on. But if you have an old house, that's actually quite difficult to do. And it's turned out that it's actually very difficult to do for the EU, because for all these fine words, what the EU has until recently completely failed to do is to make the actual linkage between the two, between the money and the values, so that you don't get those billions of EU funds unless you actually respect the values. Uh, one reason for that is obviously the structures of the EU itself, but another reason is the fears of existing member states. So many other member states aren't particularly keen 
on the idea that all the other member states could look under their fingernails and keep see if they're keeping their fingernails very clean. So that, I think, is another uh, factor. A third factor, I would have to say, as a historian, I never underestimate the role of the individual in history, is the extreme skill of Viktor Orban. I got to know Viktor Orban in Budapest in the late 1980s when he was the bright young hope of all liberals in Europe. And he then came to study with us in Oxford, as you all know, he's one of ours, I'm afraid to say. And he seemed to be you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, wonderful young liberal. Um, and we thought that this was the future, the democratic future of Central Europe. And in one sense, we weren't wrong. We weren't wrong in seeing that he was a very skillful politician. And he has remained that. And he has played the European Union to perfection, just brilliantly. So that's the third reason, Viktor Orban. The fourth reason cannot be underestimated is the membership of Viktor Orban's party, Fidesz, in the European People's Party, which is, as you know, the biggest um, grouping of European political parties of the centre-right, uh, the most powerful grouping in the European Parliament. If you remember, David Cameron, when he became leader of the Conservative Party, took the Conservatives out of the EPP because he thought it's irrelevant, it's just a talking shop between these parties. Viktor Orban wasn't so stupid. He realized that this is an absolutely crucial part of politics inside the EU because that grouping, which of course contains Angela Merkel and other major center-right leaders, caucuses constantly, caucuses before European summits, um, and is hugely influential. And Viktor Orban has been fantastically cooperative. He's been a great member of the club, um, put his uh, MEPs at the disposal of the EPP, um, and again, played it brilliantly, and just avoided being expelled, despite the fact people could see how far he was eroding democracy. Let me point you to a small irony here, talking about the nature of the European Union. Article 10, the Union is founded on representative democracy. You've all heard of the democratic deficit. How are we going to address the democratic deficit? Answer by giving more powers to the European Parliament and having European political parties. And then they'll have a Spitzenkandidat who will become a president of the European Commission. So that strengthened even more groupings like the EPP. So ironically, moves that were taken to try to strengthen the internal democracy of the European Union ended up making it more difficult to prevent the erosion of democracy in a member state of the European Union. The last point I'd like to highlight, and the list is not comprehensive, is Germany. Uh, clearly, Europe's central power, the most powerful country in the European Union, and a country which has a very special relationship with Hungary. The German car industry, as you know, is produces on a very large scale in Hungary and is a very significant part of the Hungarian economy, but it's also significant to the car manufacturers. And Viktor Orban has paid great attention to giving them the best possible conditions. And so there is a close relationship between Germany and Hungary, which is, in a sense, about Middle Europa. It's about East Central Europe becoming part of the German economy, which in effect it is. Um, and there are also historic ties that go back to the role of Hungary in enabling um, the changes in 1989 that led to German unification. So those, I think, are some of the reasons why it has proved possible in practice, though not in theory, for a non-democratic country to remain a member state. Very quickly, and then I'll open it up for discussion, 
what about this new rule of law mechanism which has been introduced as well as the existing rule of law infringement procedures and that article 7 which is in fact effectively an void because it needs the unanimity of all other member states and Poland will always veto for Hungary and Hungary will always veto for Poland. Well, it's certainly progress, uh, even though it is a compromise and has been watered down. Um, it only concentrates on the expenditure of EU funds. So if you could imagine, and this may be hard to imagine, a very honest dictator, they would have no problem with the rule of law mechanism as currently drafted, because it's going after dishonest or corrupt or abuse of EU funds. Um, fortunately, Viktor Orban is anything but an honest dictator. But the compromise which Angela Merkel negotiated and then the rest of the EU accepted for entirely understandable reasons, by the way, because remember, Hungary and Poland were threatening to veto the EU budget. And that budget and the European Recovery Fund, combined total 1.8 trillion euros, was clearly going to be essential to the post-COVID recovery of the, uh, of the Euro uh, European Union. But the compromise actually delays the implementation of the rule of law mechanism because it says we have to wait for a judgment of the European Court of Justice and we have to wait until the definition of the mechanisms working and the criteria has been developed and agreed. Why does that matter? Because Viktor Orban has an election in the spring of next year and actually he's beginning to face some significant opposition, notably the mayor of Budapest, the outsized capital of Hungary, is, um, is from the opposition side. Um, so that it's actually very, uh, I've just got a, is that better? Is that better? Or can you not hear me at all? We can hear you. Right. OK, I've stripped off my microphone and I hope I'll make that better. OK, so now someone in this audience may say, well, you've just been telling us Hungary is not a democracy. So why is an election so important? Clever clogs, but not quite clever enough, because actually. If you look at the whole history of Central and Eastern Europe since 1989, what you see is that it's precisely in these kind of hybrid regimes, not absolutely consolidated dictatorship, but also no longer liberal democracy, somewhere on the spectrum in between, that the election is a really crystallizing important moment for the character of the regime. So Slovakia 1998, remember that. Remember Milosevic, Slobodan Milosevic was toppled in Serbia, something I was privileged to witness, following an election, which the opposition said was stolen. Um, in Ukraine, same story. It was about an, a, a, a rigged election. Um, Belarus, what we're seeing to this day, maybe one day even in Russia. Uh, ironically, it's to this precisely this kind of regime that uh, that elections are most dangerous, right? So if you have a really consolidated dictatorship like, say, China, elections are no problem. Elections are no problem for Xi Jinping. Equally, if you have a really consolidated, stable liberal democracy like Germany, a few years ago, I would have said the United States, but that's a bit more difficult now. But like Germany, then the election is not, is not a problem in the sense that, yes, it will you'll get different policies, but you won't get a change of system. The system will remain the same. But precisely in these in-between kind of regimes, um, elections are really important moments. Um, in short, what 
the EU does in relation particularly to Hungary, but also to Poland, and I'm very happy to talk more about Poland in the discussion, Hungary is the extreme case, is going to be crucial, not just to the narrow question of the efficacy of the rule of law mechanism, um, but to the question which I asked at the beginning. Can, you be a, can a dictatorship be a member of the EU? At the moment, we have a hybrid authoritarian system that is a, a state that is a member of the EU. But if the EU becomes more forceful, and if there is a stronger enough, strong enough push from the opposition inside Hungary, then I hope this may be the beginning of the end of that very sad story for the EU. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Nash. That was absolutely fantastic. We really thank you for that fascinating, if frightening, overview into some of the trends of authoritarianism we've been seeing in the EU for the past 30 years. What we'd like to do now is open up the floor to our Q&A. So if you're on the call, I'd ask you to please use the raise hand function or type your question into the chat. And if you're joining us from YouTube, please feel free to write your questions in there. We've seen some already, and we'll get a committee member to read them out. So I think what we'll do is we'll actually start off with a question from the YouTube chat that relates just to something you said right at the end, Professor, which was, is Poland really less liberal or democratic? PIS is more economically progressive than much of Western Europe which is surely a fundamental precondition for true liberal democracy. So that was kind of on your point about speaking a bit more about the Poland example. I, I missed one bit of the question, which is when he, before what you said about liberal, what did he say before what you said about liberal in Europe? Um, so it said uh, PIS is more economically progressive than much of Western Europe, which is surely a fundamental precondition for a true liberal democracy. That was the question. Right. Well, it's an interesting idea that law and justice is um, progressive. I'll have to think about that. What is true is that some of its economic policies look more like left-wing than right-wing. Briefly, because I could talk all evening about Poland, um, it is much less far down the road that I have described than Hungary because... It has a much stronger, more diverse and lively civil society, which has organized very effective demonstrations, um, most recently against uh, a, 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 an extreme tightening of the abortion law, but also on earlier occasions. It has uh, a still a very strong opposition parties. Um, it has... Um, major independent media, a big independent uh, television station, a major independent newspaper, uh, Gazette Babocha, TVN is the, is the uh, television station, major internet platforms. So in a whole series of respects, um, if the question is about democracy, Poland is, is, is much less far down the road. Um, but of course, a lot of what the EU is focusing on, um, do I see, does, are, you, are you hearing me okay? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Because my machine is telling me that there's an audio problem, but anyway. Um, uh, the rule of law, the, the EU focuses a lot on rule of law, and the rule of law, alas, Poland is quite far down the road, road of the Gleichschaltung. Uh, of the legal administration, so much so that uh, an Irish court and more recently a German court have actually said that someone cannot be, as it were, extradited for their case to be heard in a Polish law court because the legal criteria, the rule of law criteria, will not be met. Um, but um, bottom line, Poland much less far down the road, many more opportunities, which is in a sense why the role of the EU and of the United States and of other liberal democracies 
uh, is, is even more important in Poland. And the key battle this year is actually not about the rule of law and not about elections, because there aren't any elections. It's about independent media and defending the independent media. Thank you so much. I think we'll hand over now to William Evans, if you'd like to give your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for a really interesting uh, talk. Uh, my question is about um, a defining feature of the Europe in the 20th century. First half was border disputes and minorities on the wrong side of the border. Isn't what we're seeing with the European Union's attitude and toleration of Hungary more about it acting in its strategic sense, tolerating a country that we know has minorities spread across European borders and could cause real problems if it was outside the Union? Over. Um, well, the implication of your question, if I understand it correctly, is that it's better to keep them inside the tent because it would be even more dangerous outside the tent. If I understand you correctly, well, I mean, that's no one is talking here about expelling Hungary from the European Union. We're simply talking about um, getting them to abide by the rules of the club. And where we have got to with Hungarian minority policy is already a very dangerous point. Just to remind you, those who don't know this little bit of um, European history, um, at the Treaty of Trianon, um, just over 100 years ago, uh, Hungary was um, deprived of a very large part of the territory it had had um, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, in the Kingdom of Hungary. And that means that there are very large minorities uh, in neighboring countries, uh, such as, uh, um, such as uh, Slovakia, um, Romania, um, and, and Serbia. Um, a former Hungarian prime minister in the 1990s said he wanted to be the, Hung the prime minister of 15 million Hungarians, of whom only 10 million were actually in Hungary. And we now have a situation which looks rather like what happened in interwar Europe before 1939, where these Hungarians in neighboring countries, many of them now have Hungarian citizenship and are receiving very large amounts of support, direct funding for their different associations and so on in the neighboring countries, which is a very great worry to, to, to places like Slovakia. So I think Hungarian minority policy, which, by the way, looked absolutely impeccable at the point when Hungary joined the EU in 2004. I have a, I still have a student who wrote a, a thesis on this. It was, looked absolutely wonderful. But as soon as Hungary got inside, it started dismantling that. Um, is itself, I think, a threat to the long term stability, internal stability of the European Union, plus the fact just to connect back to Poland that if you don't have rule of law in individual member states, then the entire legal order of the European Union is itself compromised. And the EU is nothing if not a community of law. Thank you very much. So I think our next question here ties in a little bit into some of those questions about outlooks for Hungary and stability stemming from that. So uh, Mitch Riding writes, and please do excuse my pronunciation. Uh, you mentioned the chances for the Hungarian opposition in next year's election. In 2018, we saw high turnout and Fidesz and even Jobbik performed very well. Given this, and that as Krastev and Holmes have argued, that it's most likely to align with liberal values have emigrated to Western Europe, and that Hungary has, I believe, made it difficult for those to vote from abroad, what is your realistic assessment of Fidesz being toppled in 2022? Um, great question. I think I did mention the point about uh, freedom of movement, i.e. emigration, which um, my good friend Ivan Krastev sum summed up in the great line that it's easier to change countries than to change your own country. Um, so much easier to go off and make a life in Germany or Sweden or France. Um, nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, the accumulated discontents since 2010 are very considerable. Um, 
you know, there is a, a rule of thumb in politics, which is what French students chanted at Charles de Gaulle in 1968, disons ça suffit, 10 years, that's enough. Anywhere you have a leader who's been in power for more than 10 years, um, it starts to look very dodgy because people start saying it's time for a change and the discontents have, have been accumulating and accumulating. But in addition to that, as I mentioned, we have an opposition mayor of Budapest and Budapest is extraordinarily important because it is the old imperial capital of a quite large country now being the very large capital of a quite small country. And the opposition has got its act together using very inventive techniques of uh, online organization and so on. So um, the bet would still have to be on Fides, I have to say, because Orban is extremely skillful. Um, he has the whole state budget to use. He has the huge EU funds now coming from the recovery funds to use as largesse. Um, and basically, he controls most of the media. Um, but they, the opposition certainly has a better chance than it's had for a long time. Thank you so much. Um, for our next question, we're going to hand over to Andy Laurie. If you'd like to go ahead. Uh, Professor Gardner-Nash, thank you so much for your really fascinating insights. Uh, quick question, if I may. Just on the, on the flip side of the coin, are there any specific standout examples where the democratic process has been hugely successful in sort of equivalent member states? And if you'd like to choose like maybe one example, because I'm sure it's different in, in each case. Is it then just because of a lack of the, the things that you've laid out, such as a, a figure like Orban, or are there other things where their presence actually has led to a success of democracy in kind of equivalent situations where it could have gone either way? That's a, a really great question. And, and thank you for warning me not to talk about every individual country. Um, I, I, I'm sorry to say there isn't, well, actually, I, I, let me re rephrase that. There's one rather good example, which is Estonia. But for the most part, it's a, a spectrum between sort of very imperfect liberal democracy and Hungary at the other end, uh, talking now about those states that are inside the European Union. And I think that one reason for that is, well, two reasons for that. The first reason for that um, we have a lot of populism and nationalism in our own countries, our own democracies are under a lot of stress. And many of the same causes that have led to those stresses in our own countries are leading to stresses there, plus a number of other reasons uh, which are peculiar to the, to the, to the post-communist world. But another thing is because from the outset the slogan of these revolutions was the return to Europe. And very quickly that translated into, we want to be a member state of the European Union. Um, the, the building of all the institutions, um, the, the new laws, um, the, the, the kinds of legal and political and other institutions you had in place was justified instrumentally. Um, People just had to say, well, we have to do that in order to be in Europe. And that was the end of the argument. So that you didn't have the kind of, you know, formative constitutional argument where people are saying, why do we need this? We really want to defend this. This is our own. And so in a way, what's happening now is that under the extreme challenge to democracy uh, in many of these countries, um, people are for the first time really thinking hard about why they need the separation of powers and why they need independent courts and why they need this and that pluralist institution and actually standing up for them. So the most encouraging example in the neighborhood is Slovakia, which was a laggard, which for many years was behind the others in the building of democracy, but now has an excellent new 
very liberal president and is in a sense, one would hope, beginning to come out the other, the other side. Thank you so much, Professor. Building off of that last question, we have two questions here from YouTube, um, if I may group them together. So the first one reads, how do you think the situation of Hungary and Poland is likely to impact the EU's outlook on future membership for Ukraine and other post-communist states? And the second question is, reads, do you think that other member states, such as Romania, will follow Hungary and Poland on the path of democratic backsliding? And what will that mean for the EU? Right. So the, 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 the answer to the second one, <laughs> It can be done rather quickly. They already have, um, and in particular, there are dramatically high levels of corruption in 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 both those countries. Um, but to pick up on my last answer, um, if one wants to be optimistic, one would say it's darkest before the dawn. That is to say, when the abuses and the, uh, become so extreme, then you get a strong counter reaction, and we're beginning to see those in Bulgaria and Romania. Your, your other question from YouTube is hugely, hugely important because enlargement is in many ways the greatest success story of the European Union um, and also its greater asset in the wider world, its soft power of attraction. But that soft power of attraction, it, it, it's the only empire I know where people are queuing up to join it. Most empires in history, people are rather keen on leaving them. Um, here, they're keen on joining it. Um, so that the, the, there's no lack of enthusiasm in Ukraine, certainly in Western Ukraine. And as we now see in Belarus, by the way, where we should remember we have, as we speak, a major pro-democratic and pro-European um, civil resistance movement, hugely impressive. Um, but these countries have to be able to see that at some point in the foreseeable future, they have a realistic chance of joining the EU. Now, I think that is still true for the Western Balkans, uh, what we now call the Western Balkans, um, countries of, 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 of former Yugoslavia. I, I think they do have a good chance of getting in in the next, you know, five, five to 10 years. But I think there's a real danger that there will be so much enlargement fatigue in the existing EU, plus a sense of we're just bringing on board a whole lot of East European authoritarians, um, that it may actually end up with people in Ukraine in particular, which is so important strategically, um, losing faith in the possibility of actually ever becoming a member of the EU, which at least to some extent is what sadly has happened in Turkey. Thank you. And if I might pick up on, on one aspect of what this all means for the EU, we have another question that reads, what would be effective mechanisms EU member states could apply in order to stand up or push against this autocratic or authoritarian shift, in your opinion? So, number one, top of the list, the EPP should long since have expelled Fidesz. That's the one thing that could happen tomorrow. It's a purely political decision by a, a, a grouping of political parties. And I personally think it's a scandal that it has not happened so far. And one of the reasons for that, I'm afraid, is because Germany, Angela Merkel, has not thought it worth her while um, to push for it. Indeed, we know that the German MEPs have been amongst those who've been reluctant who've been resisting the cause to expel Fidesz. And that's also because the Bavarian sister party of the Christian Democrats, the CSU, has a very close relationship with Fidesz and basically agrees a lot with Orban's anti-immigration policy. So that's top of my list. Beyond that, you simply have to make 
these linkages between values and money of the kind we have in the new the new conditionality we simply have to make them bite we simply have to make them them work that is by far the most effective way to go go through the money um at a certain point the european commission started talking about using what's called enhanced cooperation which is allowed under the treaties where a smaller group of states go ahead on a particular initiative um in my own view they should be much more forceful in that for the european recovery fund which is a specific post covid recovery fund because that would really have concentrated the minds of people in poland and hungary if suddenly there had been 750 billion euros that was going to post covid economic recovery and they were left out in the cold absolutely thank you so much i like to come in oh sure graham why don't you go ahead yeah could i ask whether the <laughs> foreign media have any part in giving a counterbalance in the country's concerned uh, british media united states media for instance giving a different picture you in mean the countries information coming from uh, uh foreign media into these countries yes um i i'm going to give you a a nuanced answer to that um because what you may have at your back of at the back of your mind is something like radio free europe in the 1980s which played an absolutely huge role in countries like poland uh, uh um you know millions upon millions of people tuned into shortwave radio to listen to radio free europe or radio liberty and believe what they were told on it um the whole picture is much more complex now because there are so many different sources of information including of course everything that's on the internet yes um, actually the key and i'm not going to talk specifically about poland because this is a crucial battle in poland this year is to preserve your own independent media because for all we spend all our time talking about social media in politics when it comes to elections be it in the united states or poland or wherever television is still the most important single medium fox news was more important than facebook uh in 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 american elections and so having the independent tele television channel having the big independent newspaper with its online presence having the big um in, in, independent internet platform those are the keys and here's the interesting point most of these have preserved their independence because either they're entirely foreign owned so the tv channel is owned by discovery the us company um the internet uh, platform by springer ringia um um so that actually for those foreign owners to hang in there becomes crucial to the defense of independent media and therefore of democracy in poland now that's a slightly uncomfortable position for many people because if you think about britain we might think that foreign owners were a big part of our problem would we have had brexit if we hadn't had the murdoch owned press and the you know conrad black owned uh, daily telegraph but in east central europe a uh, foreign owned domestic independent media are going to be key thank you thank you Thank you so much. I'd like to quickly shift us over um because there's been a couple of really interesting questions about the United States and the role they might play. So the two questions we have on that are first of all, can the Biden administration make a difference with regards to the future of competitive authoritarian regimes? And then the second question on that was you mentioned in a recent article that the election of Biden has created a fragile opening for liberal renewal. How do you see this renewal taking place and what role do you think the EU will play? Thank you. Um great question. Thank you very much. Um absolutely it can play uh, a significant role although nothing like as large as it played in the last decades of the Cold War or the 1990s and 2000s. So remember it's no accident that Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic got into NATO 
five years before they got into the EU. And that was very much thanks to the Clinton administration, which is now partly back in power. Um, so that's point number one. Yes, they can, but not as big as it would have been. I think the role is threefold. Firstly, um, law and justice in Poland and Viktor Orban loved Trump and he loved them back because, of course, the key to being loved by Trump was to love him. And um, so that the sense of having support from Trump uh, was, was quite important to those two regimes in particular, and they've lost that. Uh, secondly, because on particular issues, um, the US can intervene quite forcefully. Uh, and of course, these countries still depend on the US fundamentally for their security. Um, against Putin's Russia. So, for example, the TV channel I mentioned, um, there, you know, the US government could say something quite decisive, and actually the US ambassador has been quite strong on that. Um, and thirdly, in, and this goes to the second question, creating a context, a wider context of liberal renewal in which using something which has been very high on Biden's agenda, which is the notion of a community of democracies. He wants to have a summit of democracies. Interesting question, whether you invite Hungary to a summit of democracies, by the way. I would find it quite helpful if they just didn't invite Hungary to make a point. But if you had a sense that all around countries like Poland and Hungary, you had a movement of liberal renewal. Countries were finding answers, were being tough on populism, but also tough on the causes of populism, were developing attractive new green policies, paying more attention to social justice, doing a great job of post-COVID recovery in a kind of wider network of democracies. That would also very much change the dynamics in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, because these are relatively small countries, most of them very much looking to richer and more advanced um, and more powerful countries. So if, as it were, the spirit of the times, the zeitgeist, was moving towards liberal renewal, and, and Biden can be an important part of that, but so can Emmanuel Macron, so can a new German government after the election this autumn, then that would, in time, have a very positive impact on, on East Central Europe. Well, thank you so much for that. As I see, we're almost at eight o'clock now. I do think that was going to be our final question, but I'd like to quickly offer you the opportunity, Professor, if you have any final words you'd like to say. Um, so... I would, um, I don't quite know who I'm speaking to. Um, let me say to those who are Oxford based or actually to the wider audience too, that I lead a research project here at St. Anthony's College called Europe Stories, which is trying to work out what Europeans in general, but young Europeans in particular, want the EU to do by 2030. Um, you can find us at European Moments, all one word, europeanmoments.com. There's that very interesting opinion polling I talked about. There are also online interviews. And really my appeal to you would be, of course, to come and join in the, 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 the project. Um, let us know if you're interested in working with us record a self-interview for the website, tell us what you'd like Europe to do by 2030. But more broadly, that the answer to this question, whether Europe thinks democracy actually matters uh, in practice in all its member states or not, will depend to a large degree on the next generation of Europeans. So it's up to you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that very inspiring final touch. And uh, more importantly for that, 
really thought provoking into quite a complex issue. And as always, thank you so much to our members um, and our viewers today on YouTube for your excellent questions. It's really just been quite an interesting evening. So all that remains now is to inform you about our event next week. If you enjoyed this and you'd like to join us, we'll be having Kishan Patel, who is the Chief of GPS Cybersecurity, US Space Force, speaking to us about the strategic importance of GPS. Um, so that'll be same place, same time. We'd love for you to join us. And finally, as Miriam mentioned in the beginning, if you'd like to stick around for 15 minutes after this call and join us for just um, a, a wine evening without the wine to talk about your, your views on this event, we'd love to have you to hear if you're interested in the committee and things like that. So thank you so much again, Professor, and all of you for joining. Great pleasure. I'm sorry I can't join you for the virtual glass of wine. All the best.